Good evening and good afternoon. Welcome our viewers to this special program on Catholic faith, society and culture. My name is Piotr Bednarski. I'm based in Poland. Uh, our interview today will be with Professor Jane Adolf of Ave Maria University in Florida and for a long time uh, trusted advisor of the Holy See in the area of international law, uh, staff member of the Secretariat of the State, author of many books and the executive director of the International Catholic Jurist Association, which promotes human rights, natural law and defense and defend the, the faithful against uh, against intolerance and other form of persecutions. Uh, before we we start, I would like to warm, welcome very warmly Professor uh, Adolf, and I'm very grateful for uh, that you agreed to this uh, uh, this meeting. It's very it's great privilege to have you with us. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. And before we start, I would like to make a few administrative um, announcements. This program is organized by lay Catholics based in Poland and Switzerland, by EWTN, by the uh, Christian Conf uh, Center for Culture, Mary the Queen, and also by our uh, by as lay, as lay Catholic Association, Przybonci Wierni, Adeste Fidelis, as lay Catholic Association. Uh, I'm I'm hosting this interview with my colleague Zbigniew Przybyłowski and uh, with us are also Dr. Łukasz Mirosław from Switzerland who supports us in channeling your questions to the chat internal chat for this of the studio and we've got also Łukasz Wielowski of EWTN in who supports us in, in terms of IT infrastructure. This meeting will last 90 minutes and uh, we'll have it in the form of interview. You might ask questions on the way. We'll channel uh, the questions to our guests and try to answer as many as possible. Uh, there is a chat box in every uh, YouTube channel so you can put your questions there. Uh, we also encourage uh, audience if, if, if you want to, to go to look into EWTN Poland website and also website of the co-sponsors, uh, every organization has its own website. And also um, if you want to go into the uh, articles of Professor uh, Jane Adolf, you can go to Ave Maria University. School of Law, and then there is a whole list of the papers which we, she might allude to. Uh, following our tradition, we'll start with the short prayer. It would be our father in, in Latin, just to ask for the peace in the world, especially in this period of the world, of the, of the time before Christmas, when we know that just behind our eastern border there is a terrible war, and also there are other wars, so we pray God for, for peace and and for uh, for resolution of this uh, terrible conflict. So if we can have the text of the uh, prayer, let's start. Pater Noster, quies in Cercelis. Now I'd like to pass the floor to my uh, friend Zbigniew Przybłowski who will start this interview. Zbigniew, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Jane. Uh, it's a great pleasure to finally meet you. Um, I would like to start our conversation with uh, some information about you as a person, your um, story of life, your, your, your path uh, to where you are right now. Uh, so maybe if you could say a couple of words about, uh, you know, what shaped your value system, uh, uh, you know, how your choices were made. How did you find yourself where you are today as a, as a leading scholar and, a, and a distinguished lawyer? Um, how did you become a Catholic? How did it happen that you decided to pursue, um, you know, both of your lawyers and, and sports careers? Okay. Well, thanks so much for having me. So, um, I was born and raised in a Catholic family, nine of us, uh, mother, father, seven kids. 
And, um, you know, uh, my mom and dad were both practicing Catholics. And so we did the uh, daily rosary first Fridays um, every, you know, we had Saturdays of the month in terms of confession. And uh, it was a very intense Catholic upbringing in Canada. It's, it's very anti-Catholic once you get out of your family. And we also had uh, Catholic public school systems, which I went to. Um, I would think that my, my character was really formed um, by, through athletics in the Calgary public system in Calgary, Alberta, there's a very intensive competitive sports going on in club teams. And I have a choleric personality. And so I, I, I love sports. And so I was on a number of teams and, and that forged my character because there's a lot of virtues involved uh, that you have to cultivate in order to do competitive sports, perseverance, patience, loyalty, uh, getting along with others, collaboration, but a lot of hard work. Uh, so I think that has been a, a great uh, forger of my uh, character. And then I took after my dad. Um, I remember once he held the door open. It's such a little thing. Uh, we were going to mass, Sunday mass, and he was in his Sunday best. And I remember looking up and he opened the door for an older lady. And I thought that was so noble. Um, and I wanted to do that. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure why that's so, but it was this strength of character of my dad. And he was uh, a, the crown prosecutor of a city. And so he was doing all the murders when I was growing up and prosecuting those for 15 years and then eventually became a provincial court judge. And so it was his masculinity and strength of character that really drew me together with the athletics. Um, now, my mom, a very strong character, her generations come from Iceland, um, but she's, and she's a caregiver, and there's no uh, fruff or frills with my mother. It was very serious, and I remember being brought up uh, when she was, we got into our 20s, and everybody was getting married and being bridesmaids and thinking about these beautiful dresses. I remember him, her saying to her four daughters, it's not about the dress. It's very, very difficult. So, so that was um, something that always stuck with me. But she was a great, had a great love for the saints. And so, uh, and a great love for books. And so the majority of my gifts were books and books of the saints. And, and um, so it was uh, family, God, academics and sports and Sometimes I just believe that our Lord made me a little warrior for his purposes. Okay. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about your career in law? I understand about the universities that you attended. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, qualifications to practice law in Canada and in the U.S., yeah. uh, your education uh, in, uh, in, in Rome. Um, how how did this whole thing play play out? Play yeah, out, okay. So um, I did all this. I did so many different sports, but by the time you're in your grade twelve year, if you want to go to university, you have to choose a sport. So mm -hmm. by grade ten or eleven, I knew I wanted to play university sport, a uh, basketball. So I went to the University of Calgary. I played on the team for five years. You have five years of eligibility my studies was in political science um, and I stretched my studies out for five years so I could play basketball. And then um, it was through the courses I took that I was doing very well in political science and law, um, but I really wanted to play professional basketball. I, I was playing on men's teams um, because the speed I had I'd gotten, uh, I was I was playing the best years of my life, my grade, my my fourth and fifth year, and I wanted to play professional. So I was on men's summer teams, and I went to the national team tryout when I was nineteen, actually, and made it through all the tryouts and remained. And uh, so I was there for three weeks, and other people were sent home after the first week, and um, it was the last play of the game, and we were scrimmaging. And I drove in and this girl was slow. So she stuck out her knee 
And um, I had a Charlie horse, so it was so deep uh, that I would be out for a month. I remember being brought to the training room and the the coach came in and he said to me, I was going to take you on the A team, but you're injured and I can't take you. What I didn't realize that that was my shot. It was over. And so I, I kept on trying out for the team, but I never made it because I needed bigger people. And, and it was essentially a game changer because once you do not make the national team, it's very difficult to take play professional. And so eventually I was asked to, I got an agent to do this professionally. And the agent explained to me, listen, Jane, I can put you on a team. It's not going to be very good. And you're going to have to move yourself up. And I had no interest in doing that because I was playing such fast and strong basketball with these men um, that I didn't want to just putz around. And, and so I gave up that and decided, OK, now it's, it's time to study law. And uh, that's when I went to McGill University and I had to upgrade because I, want, I had to show McGill University that I could study and get straight A's. So I was there for a year to try to get straight A's. I almost got straight A's. I think I, I got a B plus or an E minus and something, but they let me in and it was the only law school I applied to. I didn't apply to any other law school. They let me in. It was a four year program. I get civil law, common law degree. And then my dad who had worked in the university in Calgary, you know, it's a benefit to your family because your dad has built up his own reputation. So when you go back to the city you know, they, they, they know who you are because of what your dad's done. And I was able to get a clerking position at the Court of Queen's Bench and the Court of Appeal, and that's prestigious. And, and that was um, due to my dad and, and, and because they knew his name, so they knew my name. And then I worked uh, at a large law firm, and I realized that uh, I had two desires. One was to, to do international law, and the other one was to do criminal law. And when I got to the law firm, I realized that I would never be really doing international law because it was uh, done mostly by men and it was oil and gas industry and you had to work yourself up. And I thought I wasn't going to wait till I was 70. So I then said, OK, let's see if I can see what happens with criminal law. So the prosecutor's office uh, position came open and it's considered a downward position from a law firm, but I took it anyway. And my dad was still a judge at the time. So I was working in his, I was working in the system as a prosecutor in his old office while he was still a provincial court judge. And then he retired out and I remained there for three years. And it was at that time that I realized uh, that it was something I could not do for the next 30 years because they were understaffed and I was working unbelievably uh, difficult hours and we were understaffed by seven people, not paid well. And it was at that point that I went on a pilgrimage to Italy mm. and I had studied art history for, uh, I'd studied art history at the University of Calgary and I'd actually thought I was going to be an artist. So I had taken one year of art and studied architecture and, and art history. So I'd given it up because I, I just didn't feel I knew enough about the world. And I always thought I'd come back to it. But in any event, I took this pilgrimage, got off the bus and just looked at the city and the colors. And I felt at home. I felt I was in my Catholic home. I saw John Paul II's head, you know, face on the bus. I, I, I saw nuns and priests, um, whereas in Calgary, Alberta, they had they had just, you know, they, they no longer wore their their clerics or their habits. And, and I just felt at home and I said, I'm going to go back here and live. So I, I went back home, packed up and I had that desire to see international. So I had tried criminal law. Now it was time for international, and I used canon law as a vehicle to put myself in an international environment. And so I enrolled myself in the Opus Dei School at Santa Croce, and I studied canon law. And I used my dissertation to um, 
put me into an international environment of the subject matter. And that's when I studied the Holy See. And it's kind of an interesting story about the dissertation. Um, but that's how I got to Rome. Okay. And, and, and so this is how you got into the canon law as well. Um, now, how did you, um, if I may say so, stumble upon the issues of persecution of Christians? And uh, how did you encounter the issue of sex abuse among the clergy? I mean, these are uh, things that are prominent in your work and in your career, coming out of home from a Catholic family, uh, a devout Catholic yourself. Um, how did you find it? How, how did it find you? And what effect did it have on you? Okay, so when I was in Rome, um, someone had said to me, Jane, your issue will come up. And I, I didn't know what that meant, but I had to pick a topic of a thesis. And uh, I love kids. I love children. And so the big problem was finding a Catholic man. And I love children. And so I started to go. I was invited to be an advisor at United Nations conferences because Human Life International was going to these conferences, fighting for the family, fighting for life and blocking these ideologies. And they asked me to be a legal advisor. And so I started to go. And then I realized the hostility against the Holy See because it had ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I thought, this is curious. Why is everybody hostile against the Holy See? And of course, they, had, they, they took the position that the Convention on the Rights of the Child was really a bad document and that it was really promoting an autonomous child where the state became a trustee of the child and the, and the parents were moved to the side. And, and I, I had... Um, I knew that the Holy See had ratified it. I knew it must have a good, I, good, good explanation. So that became the topic of my dissertation in canon law when I did my PhD, when I did my JD, and and it was, it was entitled uh, "The Holy See: A Light to the Nations," uh, having to do with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now it's it's a complex situation because with the Holy See, you have the Holy See, you have the Catholic Church, you have Vatican City State. How does it implement? But I didn't really understand uh, how I could understand that if I didn't compare it to the Canadian situation. So it was eight chapters, usually dissertations are four, and they're all to do with one issue in canon law and you go back in history. And I said to myself, I don't want to work as a canon lawyer back in the diocese. I want to work in international law. So I carved out this thesis that required me to do a comparative study between the Canadian system and, and how it implements uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, international law, where the Convention on the International Child is part of that system, and the Holy See, and then the magisterium on children, and then what is it has to say about the convention, and then conclude by saying how it implements. Well, I finished my dissertation, and there were no answers to the question as to how it implemented. And I remember giving my dissertation, they said, you don't have an answer. And, and I said, well, I can't make it up. There are no answers. The Holy See doesn't know how it implements. These are legal implementations. And so um, if you fast forward to 20 years later, I'm asked to come in to the Holy See to help them on reports having to do with the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And we are developing arguments for the first time. And I remember when I first started to do the Convention on the Rights of the Child, there were people at the Santa Croce saying, what are you doing? What does that have to do with canon law? And I said, well, uh, you've got to implement it somewhere. Is it going to be implemented in the ter territory? Is it implemented in, in, in canon law, universal? Is it implemented in the Roman Curia? Like, where is it implemented? And so we were working those questions out 20 years later. I was asked to finish my dissertation, essentially, when... People thought it was bizarre to begin with. Uh, so it was it was one of those providential things. And in the meantime, in those 20 years, I had started to do a lot of writing on the Holy See and the rights of the child within the context of the family, the rights of the natural family. And eventually I was doing some work with Geneva in New York. So that's kind of how I, I, I segued into children. And then when I was brought inside, 
um, it was a sad situation because while I was in there, there was some tragic situations in Chile, Honduras, and the McCarrick scandal. And it seemed to me, yes. So that was at the end of my tenure with them. By the time I got in there, we had we had worked on reports that the Holy See had to file with the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And we were working on those for the Holy Father and developing arguments and asking questions. And it's very delicate work and, and very difficult work. And we were able to do the reports. One report was 17 years late. I mean, you're supposed to be doing these reports regularly, but we were able to finish some key reports. And then by the time that I was having great difficulty in, 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 in the Holy See was having great in, in difficulty in implementing certain things due to um, obstacles inside the Vatican, as you can imagine, a 2,000 year old uh, institutions not really embracing new things quite readily. And that's when I understood that we had some real problems be, in relations between priests and women within the working environment. And I was, and then the Me Too, the Me Too movement hit. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying to the, my superiors, this is going to hit the church. And, and you don't have any sexual harassment laws. You have no complaint mechanisms. You have no human resources. And when it hits the church, it's not going to be a cleric on woman issue. It's going to be a man on man issue. Just by the nature of what I saw there, I was surrounded by priests, very little masculinity. And, and that was disturbing to me because in all my, my environments, they were heavily masculine in, in, in the good sense of the term. Um, I, I've never accepted this toxic masculinity. There's, I, I'm drawn to masculinity as something that I admire for the leadership and, 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 and what it does and how I was drawn to my, my father as a, as a leader. But you didn't see that in the Vatican. You, you saw effeminacy and, and you saw, you, you didn't see fathers, you didn't see brothers. And uh, it was disturbing. So when I made that suggestion, um, it wasn't taken seriously. And it was like our, our lady said, well, you're, you're, if you're not going to if you're not going to listen to her, why don't you listen to this? And then the Chile scandal broke, where it involved bishops that had had been present during the sexual um, molestation of, of of seminarians. Honduras, there was um, a suicide attempt by a, a young seminarian who had quit his finished his lustful relationship with another seminarian and some seminarians had complained about the homosexual environment. And then the third scandal right after that was the McCarrick. And of course that was homosexual to do with seminarians. And then as, as, as the newspaper articles continued, we knew it was young boys as well. At that point, um, I just said to myself, I'm going to do a conference. We're going to do a conference right now on this. No one's talking about it. And, 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 the, and homosexuality as a word was tab is still taboo in, in, in the Holy See. And, and, it, and if you do not talk about it, we cannot protect children. If you do not admit that homosexuality, the highest victims are male adolescents and young men, including seminarians, we cannot stop this. So I held a conference. I invited the Holy See to participate because as a, I, I had two hats all the time. I'm working for the Holy See, but I'm also a professor. And I was directed to the Commission for the Protection of Children, which was twofold. The implication was, well, Jane, the issue is really the children, which wasn't true because the three scenarios were seminarians, okay? So to me, okay, I'll, I'll get them involved. I'll ask them whether they want to come. But to me, we're doing a conference on male-on-male -male violence in the church, which includes adolescent males, seminarians, and young adults. Never been done before. It's one of those issues no one wants to touch. It's taboo to mention it in the Vatican. We're going to deal with it. 
has to be deal with it. Have to direct on truth. Let's go. And we got almost 30 scholars involved. Um, the Pontifical Commission for the for Children, Protection of Children, did send a nice statement. And as a result, we knew that it was going to have some sort of impact. Uh, what had happened is po Pope Francis had organized a summit on sexual abuse in February of 2019, we held the conference in September of 2016 within months of the breaking of these cases. And um, sorry, I guess it was eight, I guess it was, it was in 18, 2018. So we held the conference in September. By, by December, we had summaries of all of the papers published through Inside the Vatican as an insert. And um, Robert Monaghan submitted that, his magazine, because it was in his magazine, he sent it to every president of every Episcopal conference. And we knew that the February 2019 meeting was gathering all the presidents from the Episcopal conference. So we had something there for them to see, to consider Let's stop this. Let's protect our, 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 our boys and young men. And they decided not to deal with it. It became only a meeting to get those straggling conferences to do what they were supposed to do years ago, pursuant to, a, I think it was a 2011 request for them to get their safe uh, guarding um, guidelines in order. Um, you know, and, and that was needed. That was needed. Okay, so you're not going to deal with the issue. But um, by that time, things continued to develop. And then we got the book was about to be published. But by that time, I had left to go back to the United States. And I understood that my time with with the Holy See was coming to an end. And I resigned. And then the book was published. And um, I think in some quarters, the book has been ignored because it's a direct dealing with the homosexual crisis in the church and how it's affecting our young boys and young men. That's how that came across. And we're doing another book that's forthcoming and it's called Clerical Sexual Misconduct, A Foundational Conversation. This is between men and women, but we're not talking about the nitty gritties of situations. We're just talking, you know, having a conversation between lay women, lay men, lay women, clerics uh, about relations in the church. And then um, obviously solid relationships. How do you speak to women? I mean, what I saw in the Vatican was extremely strange to me. Um, it, it, but I, I don't think I entered a professional work environment, it's almost like I entered a religious order and I didn't sign up for a religious order. And I certainly didn't sign up for a military because it sometimes there's things run like a military. So that's how the clerical sexual misconduct issue uh, was put on my lap. Basically the Christian, the Christian issue was something different. Do you want to hear about how the Christian issue came across? Yeah, this is what I'm going to ask you because uh, I okay. know that in the interview while you've been in Poland, you raised this point and this was quite interesting because you make a clear distinction between the persecution and genocide okay. and you also make some comments about uh, blasphemy laws and uh, tolerance. Uh, your views on, on why Christians are so persistently persecuted. Okay. We don't see that much of this uh, zeal for persecution for other religions. What is this all <laughs> well, about? To me, you know, everything I do is in the context of understanding that we're in a, a cosmic battle. It's, it's a battle between principalities. I mean, it, it's spiritual. And so... Uh, all three of us here have been born into this cosmic battle at this time. 
and we are called to respond. Now, the way I look at it is the war has been won by our Lord, but we are required to pick up our sword every day. And that doesn't mean we, we have to be successful, but we have to pick it up. And so the thing with the persecution, the Christians that bothered me was Pope Francis had made uh, a statement, I believe in the European parliament, and it was a pretty bloody paragraph where he talked about the Christians in Iraq being, you know, beheaded, crucified. And it, and it was something that most journalists love because it was filled with blood and gore. And I deliberately watched the media to see whether anyone picked up on it. And there was absolute silence. At the same time that that happened, I kept on seeing these, these um, news stories in Italy. So you'd have a news story of a group of Christians being persecuted and killed in Iraq. And then the, the next two seconds, it focuses on a woman with a, her, a, a, a kerchief from a Muslim community. And she's on a bus in Italy and saying, I've been persecuted because, you know, you know, they're attributing that persecution to me. And the rest of the story was all about her. And then Islamophobia. This happened so many times that I had had enough. Mm -hmm. So I said, we're doing it. And then the third factor was the nuncios in Geneva and some of the other, maybe even New York, they were using the term religious minorities, persecuted religious minorities. They refused to use the word Christians, even though Pope Francis did, they refused. And then when they went to list the groups being persecuted, it was Yazidis and, and you wouldn't see Christians. And that was the last straw for me. So I did this conference and I said, we're going to call it persecution and genocide of Christians. Not only are we going to talk about Christians, we're going to use the word genocide. And I gathered these experts in, uh, in Naples, Florida. And one of them is Nina Shea from the Hudson Institute. And she's been working on Christian persecution for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. This lady is a bombshell. Don't mess with her. She's tenacious. She stays at it. She's, she's basically a lobbyist and she just goes after these politicians. But she, the way that she is able to be persuasive is that she's a wonderful writer and writes a lot in the Wall Street Journal. So if you don't want to listen to her, she's going to write all about how you're not helping anybody. How are you going to get elected? So she has some clout and she's an incredible lady. And, and so I met her. She came to our meetings. We had government officials at our meetings. And then we had people that band together under her leadership to hold workshops. And eventually they were able to get the evidence they needed to produce a document uh, with the help of Knights of Columbus to convince Carrie uh, who was the uh, Secretary of State to declare a genocide. And that, I thought that our little conference created an atmosphere and impetus for, the, for those experts to work. And then we published the proceedings, the book, and we hoped that the book would give courage to those that were being persecuted, that, that, that we are here, uh, we understand what's happening, we're documenting your suffering. You're not alone. And, and so the book, uh, I thought, was a great success. Now, I tried to get a kind of a book launch in Rome because some, you know, people do book launches and I couldn't get the book launch done. Um, you know, you have to be, I suppose, politically embraced. So I, I didn't manage to do that. And, and so I, you know, I really... Uh, go forward on these projects without considering getting involved cardinals, bishops, because that's political right there and then. And I don't want to deal with politics. I want to deal with people who are concerned about the issues and the people that are suffering. 
and that's who I bring to the table. Mm. It's, it's very moving what you're saying because uh, this means that you want, uh, in any case, move forward with the cause like uh, genocide of Christians. And in that area, I would like just to ask you where you see the, the, the highest intensity of persecutions. Is it Nigeria? Is it China? Is it Pakistan? Do you have a, a sort of ranking list or, or some kind of map of the highest intensity of persecution of Christians? Yeah, uh, it's important are, for us. We, right. we also think about our brothers in, in faith, and and uh, it is good to know more on on that. Right. Well, the uh, Nina Shea, we used to be on the commission, the religious commission, the religious freedom commission that that that's that works out of the United States, and they have countries of particular concern they do their annual report and and that is uh the commission reports to take a look at uh, in my circumstance uh because i deal with a number of issues i deal we did with iraq although our book was uh persecution and genocide of christians in the middle east we we you know we did deal with a couple of chapters uh, dealt for example with china since the book, I've been working with Nina on the persecution of Christians in China. And uh, Cardinal Bo, uh, a couple of years ago, had an extended Pope Benedict's call for a, a day of prayer. And I believe it's the same day as Our Lady um, the persecution of Christians, actually, help of Christians. And then Cardinal Bo extended that a, a, a week. And then a group of us, uh, lay people from around the world, created a campaign to promote Cardinal Bo's statement. And he had a beautiful statement, and we put it to video. And then uh, the International Catholic Jurist Forum, ICJF, which I'm a founder and the executive director, we then did a series of videos. And I interviewed Chris Smith, uh, Senator Chris Smith and Nina Shea, Benedict Rogers from the UK is doing a fabulous job. Um, also, uh, uh, Lord Alton from the UK. And we, and we got their opinions and we covered all of it from, you know, your hatred of God per se, based on the communist uh, thinking, to uh, harvest, forced harvesting of organs to torture in prison, to black prisons for priests, um, to not allowing children to enter a church, to translations of the Bible that are um, deliberately distorting the gospel message that China is engaging right now. And, and because China is all about force and using violence, there's a translation of uh, Christ with the adulterous woman and the Chinese translation is Christ kills the woman at the end by stoning her. That's the distortion that's happening right now. Also, since the agreement between the Vatican and China, and Nina Shea has is, is been very critical of that agreement, has many articles out. She makes the point that that agreement basically annihilated the underground church and that... Um, it's led to the death of and torture of priests, and it's also uh, caused uh, more difficulties for the church because we know right now that uh, Xi Jinping's picture is in all the churches, and there's meetings to inculcate the bishops on how to incorporate his sayings into homilies, and, and this is going on right now. Now, in the Vatican's defense, the Holy See is saying, well, listen, we've got all these dioceses. We have to fill them up. And But who are you filling the diocese up with? People that are going to give homilies about the, 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 the Chinese CCP communist slogans? Like, I, I, this is where we are. And, and, and the, the genocide, of course, of Uyghurs. And the um, and the persecution basically of the Falun Gong. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And 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 China. And this is the thing that's scary for me. China is held up as the model 
the model where we're supposed to be transitioning to by Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. Mm. We will talk about that a little bit later. I would like to still uh, elaborate a little bit more about this case of uh, persecution of Christians, because on one hand we see persecution organized in the form of totalitarian country like China, when there is a systematic and uh, very technologically orientated uh, social scoring and monitoring of everyone, and especially any minority which is uh, outside of the control of the communist China Communist Party. Right. So uh, my question is whether this goal, which was uh, initially presented by Vatican by Holy See, that we want to fill the uh, the positions of the of the bishops in China, and that's why the deal, the secret deal with China, is necessary. Was this uh, effective after this? few years of this ex existing of this uh, of this t secret uh, agreement with Chinese Communist Party have has the Vatican been successful in achieving this goal well according to Nina Shea no and she's she's the person to go to on this and look at her articles and and no she would say no that it hasn't really achieved anything but 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 it left left the uh, Xi Jinping very confident to go forward and continue its persecution. Uh, Cardinal Zen ha has been a very outspoken person about this agreement, claiming that um, that the Roman Curia and people in the Vatican just don't understand China. On the other hand, China, the, the people in the Vatican say, listen, we know what's going on. We put our hand out expecting to receive a knife and uh you know it's really this this understanding uh of of it's almost a diplomacy of casaroli uh, in in terms of trying to appease these communist governments and, and it's never worked and it's never you know when you have people that w would argue that casaroli just didn't get it and 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 he never understood john paul ii and, or his approach, and uh, they would argue that Casaroli's approach has always been wrong, uh, except you've got people that, that disagree and, and, and believe that Casaroli is the way forward, his, his vision on, on these type of dialogues. Now, this word dialogue is, uh, is being overused. Its essence has to be the communication of truth. And I believe that that's how Pope Benedict XVI has defined it. And for us to use dialogue when there is going to be no communication of truth on the other side is, I just think it's a misnomer. I, I am so fed up with the term dialogue that I am now using, do you want to communicate, communicate about the truth? Okay. Let's sit down, have a, a communication about the truth, because mm -hmm. I don't understand what it means. Mm -hmm. All right, it's it's um, interesting what you're if, saying. If I may, Piotr, yeah. if I may, what about the persecution of Christians in Canada and in the United States and in Poland? Um, we are talking about faraway countries and about bloody regimes, but um, the last two and a half, three years. Uh, we have undergone <clears throat> something that was until recently unthinkable. I mean, you could go to a store, you could hop on a bus and, and take a ride, but you could not go to church. Churches were closed. Um, you know, right now in Poland, you hear um, opinions that um, a confession of, of underage people should be forbidden because it's abuse. Uh, you know, you have a court verdicts where... Uh, you know, a person who is uh, performing a cutting of a throat of an effigy of Archbishop of Krakow is being uh, absolved by two courts, by the, the basic level and the, and the appellate court. And if that happened the other direction, you know, the person who, who would do that would rot in jail. And there is a, um, uh, an, an all-encompassing culture of saying and thinking and, and doing that, you know, hurting a Catholic is fine, you know, but anybody That's else? That's it. So, so it's always been okay to hate Christians. 
I mean, that's just it, right? It's, it's okay to hate Christians. It's almost cool to hate Christians. And quite frankly, I'm fed up with that as well. So it's not, it's intolerance. But you're still persecuting Christians if you're not drawing blood. But we have to be careful. In Europe, for example, we've had people beheaded in France. A whole line of journalists were killed. And someone showing an image of Mohammed, the head was, was taken off. Okay. In Canada just recently, there was some talk of some mass grave. It never materialized never materialized no one dug up any bodies the pope was summoned by um justin trudeau to apologize came and apologized and may and, but during this time period there was people uh, burning churches and yes. trudeau did absolutely nothing and basically fanned the fire I still don't know of any investigation that has a mass grave. And not only that, it's, it's this constant trying to shut churches. Now, the tragic thing about the shutting of churches is that it, it actually started in Rome. Okay? So we have, we have Pope Francis... Uh, talking originally about, you know, act of love on, on a vaccination and how we have to think of others. And people in the United States that were really using their heads. And what do I mean by that? When you're listening to people from the CDC, that one day you need no masks, another day you need a mask, then you need two, then you have to take a, a, a test but even if you test negative, you got to take them. You got to wear a mask. You're sitting there listening. And if you're using your reason, it makes absolutely no sense. And so if you're listening to the instructions, then you hear from the Pope, it's an act of love. And then you're hearing that I don't understand how there could be any reasons that you can't take the vaccine. Well, that goes right against the CDC letter or the CDC document on vaccines that talked about that it's a matter of conscience, talked about they had to be safe and effective, talked about the, the fact that there were reasons why you could reject it. And then we have a Pope that's ignored that document. Then we have a Supreme Court in the United States quoting the Pope in his personal capacity that everybody should be using the vaccines. And that's what happened in the United States. But that's why the Pope came out and made those statements. And then you have to ask yourself, why? Who's, who's asking the Pope to do those things? Who is he taking his instructions from? And that's when you get into the global reset and understanding what's happening. We have to use our minds, use our reason, listen to what's being said. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think I think we are sort of on the same on the same page with that. But there are many sort of different aspects of. Um, what is happening with the world right now. And um, one of the things that it seems that the Vatican is subscribing to is this concept of Agenda 2030, which has been um, sort of brought to our attention because we are uh, fathers of children who are invited to attend uh, a meeting that would be promoting Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Grows, Goals. Sorry. Could you, you are, you have written about the agenda and yeah. uh, could you explain to us and to our viewers, what is the agenda and what is wrong with it? What are the sustainable development goals and what is the problem with them? Okay, so the UN Agenda 2030 is essentially a non-binding document 
that follows other non non-binding documents similarly I think you had uh, Agenda 21, you had Millennium Development Goals, and there, there's these goals, and, and when they come up every 10 years, um, you, you, you reconstitute them again. I believe that communist countries do this all the time. We've got something for 10 years and, and they go about it. So it's something similar to that. The difference with the UN Agenda 2030, because these other agendas didn't really have a lot of money behind them, and, uh, you know, so you say, well, yeah, it's just that, okay, we don't really have an implementation mechanism. The difference with UN 2030 is that there's money behind it um, and there's uh, considerable, considerable money and considerable organization. And so the World Economic Forum has entered into an agreement with the uh, Secretariat um, of the United Nations, and that is to help implement it, which means that there's billions of dollars involved and then hit, and then a list of corporations and businesses associated with the World Economic Forum to bring everybody together to do this. And then you have these local hubs, which is a group of corporations that are more on a local level to make sure it's implemented locally. And then you have, for example, um, organized organs within the United Nations where states usually make their applications for money. Well, now you make your application for a grant and you have to prove that it's in line with the sustainable development goals. Now we know that we're moving uh, to also uh, how you invest your money. So there's been an, an article today on BlackRock and how uh, there are companies now withdrawing their money from BlackRock um, because of the woke capitalism in because it's 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 saying that you have to invest in, uh, you, you know, certain certain uh, companies uh, that are politically correct. And so there's a big fight going on with that right now. So what what we have here is we have a plan that in the past probably wouldn't be that damaging. But now it's actually a blueprint to be used. The plan itself is a declaration. And within the declaration, you have 17 sustainable development goals. And some of the, some of the goals, you look at them and, and you think, well, okay, end poverty, that's great, raw. Uh, you know, end hungry, you know, hu hunger, what's wrong with that? It's connected with um, 169 targets and over 200 indicia to try to bring this to fruition. And uh, some of the, uh, obviously some of the wording is problematic because it's sexual and reproductive rights, which includes abortion. Other terminology talks about gender and empowerment of women. Well, gender is separate from empowerment, empowerment of women. So you've probably got gender ideology in all its radical forms. And then you're using it um, also to promote emergencies. So, you know, for health, we've got the COVID becomes an emergency and then the climate becomes an emergency and you're always pushing these emergencies. And um, one of the things that Klaus Schwab talked about in, uh, he's the one that made the term popular because he had a book called COVID and the Reset and the idea is essentially your reset is to is to cause political, social and economic chaos. You have to create chaos. So so you have to reset it. You have to eliminate the way that you're actually thinking, doing, consuming, uh, producing and distributing. And, and then you create something new. That's the new set and the reset. You think about your phone sometimes talk about resetting your phone, you know you're going to lose things on your phone if you reset it. It's, it's quite a, a big thing. So, but it's a blueprint now backed by billions of dollars. And quite frankly, it needs trillions of dollars to operate um, annually, I believe. And it's, and it's being used um, by Klaus Schwab and global elites to get to this point of pushing us into the direction of less human freedom, 
more surveillance and more control. And it's being, it's being used very effectively. And, when, and, and then to bring a new way of how we think about food, how we think about farming, how we think about human settlements. But remember in all of this, we're trying to get to a reset. So this idea of, of food security is that you create food scarcity. You create elements of starving people so that you can restart. And so we can all start eating insects. You change farming so we don't aren't using cattle and you build these warehouses for insects that we'll be all eating. And, 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 and then you're arguing that, you know, this is all good for the environment. It's about moving us to a society where we're controlled by what's called public private partnerships, the multi stakeholders, and it's government and um, big farm, big business, and they're the ones that run things. And it's not based on a democracy, or if it is a democracy, it's, it's some sort of government within the doc democracy. Other ones talk about a totalitarianism that, that the document that the democracy is developing into this. And we see this with Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, with all of his policies and the trucker convoy and um, all of the freedoms and rights and the shutting down of churches and the opening of liquor stores when, when the churches were, it's, it's simply controlling of people. And what's the model? China. The model's China. Schwab, uh, within the last two weeks, talked about how the model is China. That's communism. So if that's what's going on, we're using a blueprint that's there for us to promote global communism, totalitarianism, whatever you want to call it, deeply Marxism, it's there and it's being used because it's now got incredible amount of funding behind it and organization. And so the funding is coming from this these big corporations who want to produce Hamburgers out of insects and uh, <laughs> forbid our, our yeah. eating of, uh, of, of meat and, and good yeah. things like that. And, you know, um, although this is disgusting and probably uh, criminal to forbid us to, to eat steaks and eat insects, um, I, I can understand their motivation. Now, yeah. it seems that the Vatican has subscribed to the idea of, of uh, sustainable growth and is promoting some of this uh, through um, the, for instance, the youth days. How, how did this happen? How did um, the church got involved into supporting an agenda? And just sustainable growth, if it's sustainable, that means it's, it's managed and limited, right? And a great reset is something that we are going to stop the economy developing in the national in a natural way, and we are going to make it develop in a way that we have come up with. So, how did how did the church, how did the Vatican um, end up supporting this kind of ideas? Okay, so um, what's kind of fascinating when you study this, and I, it's in my paper, and I, I'm actually working on a documentary to understand that the foundation of the UN Agenda 2030 was really in the, mid, in the mid 1990s based on the world conferences. And the Holy See played an important role in those conferences because it blocked a number of ideologies, uh, the universal right to abortion, um, these human settlements, which is all about housing and they didn't wanna use the word family. So the Holy See had to fight for the word family I mean, John Klink uh, was a leading delegate uh, at these for the Holy See, and um, the Holy See blocked all kinds of uh, ideologies, including the, the radical uh, gender ideology. So fast forward it to 2015, and, and back in, in 1990s, you had individual conferences, one on sustainable development, one on population development, one on women, one on human settlements. I mean, they were all various conferences that were just going one after another. 
And from what I've read, a part of that had to do with the United Nations reinvigorating itself as an organization because uh, Ronald Reagan had been pretty critical of the United Nations. So they went into this world conference to reassert itself. And if you think about it, UN Agenda 2030 is all of these elements into one document. Mm -hmm. Now you had a strong Holy See fighting that. And so it's, it's ironic that you have the Holy See now implementing this document where you still have the problems ingrained in this document that the Holy See fought in the mid 1990s. So it's peculiar, it's peculiar. But the way I look at it is this, the people that are surrounding the Pope right now and analyzing these documents and helping him sort through it, they weren't part of the 1990 uh, negotiations. They've never been at the negotiations. They have no idea what it is to negotiate at, at, at the United Nations a lot of these people. It's a spiritual battle. When I was negotiating, uh, actually giving advice to non-governmental organizations as, as a legal uh, consultant, I stopped staying at hotels. I could not do it. I had to find a, a, a convent where the Blessed Sacrament is. It's The, the spiritual battle is real. It's a battle of words. It's a battle of ideologies. It's not about the poor. And, and you can tell in the room. And, and, it's, and so when these negotiations are going on, and so when you have something like the UN Agenda 2030 that has a lot of the elements that the, the, that the Holy See blocked, it's now come up again. Um, but it's back now with a lot of money. You have people... Um, that are endorsing it, but you also have a Pope from Argentina. And that means something because from these countries that have their own civil strife, they look to the United Nations as a savior. Hmm. Okay, number one. Number two, he's Jesuit. And right there, I, I can't go any further because I haven't studied it, but how the Jesuits view things seem to me completely different than the most of us. And then the, the third thing is, is, is the Pope really has his own socioeconomic agenda. And whether he's adopted the one from Klaus Schwab and global elites, or he thinks he's promoting his own, he's really in the same camp and he's using the same language uh, deliberately so. In an article or an interview that was given by Cardinal Turkson to Edward Penton, Cardinal Turkson, you know, said that we're deliberately trying to get our, our, our wording closer and, uh, and, and mentioned that the big difference is that, that the Holy See, it's rooted in scripture. Well, in a paper I just gave at a conference here in Rome where we were challenging um, or responding to the Pontifical Academy for Life's publication, which is really uh, watering down the magisterium. Um, and I would, I would argue, and I have argued, that, that there's a loss of faith there. That, that's one of the things that comes off. It's a crisis of faith that's happening in the Pontifical Academy for Life, for sure, and perhaps other dicasteries. But, but you, you, have this, you have this idea that you can use similar language. Well, in my paper, I saw three developments. You had in the mid 1990s to 2011, the word gender and the Holy See blocked that. There was a radical understanding of it and it blocked it. Then from 2011 to 2016, you have another fight over a sexual orientation and gender identity, SOGI is the acronym. The Holy See has fought against the, that terminology as eradication of the foundation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, who sees the human person, human person made male, female, with reason and conscience called to, uh, to act towards the spirit of brotherhood. There's a, not a perfect anthropology, but there's an anthropology there. The third element I look at 
is 2016 to now. And we have this diversity, inclusion, and equity slash equality. Well, that terminology looks pretty similar to what we use in the Catholic tradition as diversity, unity, and equality. And I know that the Pope Francis is using inclusion a lot, and that's usually not the word we use, and he uses diversity a lot, but there's deep philosophical and theological significance to the words within our tradition, and they're being melted together. And in my paper, I argue that diversity, inclusion, equity, and equality that's being pushed by the United Nations is pushing gender ideology with new terminology, and the Holy See has yet to respond in a way that would critique that language. But is, is the Holy See, uh, does it have an intention to respond to it this way? Um, I mean, it, one of the things is uh, that, that make me uh, sort of wonder about the, the motives is when you adopt these terminologies, when you support this kind of ideologies, you do it for some sort of purpose. Is the purpose of the Holy See the salvation of souls? I mean, when we are pushing, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the, 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 uh, sustainable development goals, the, the 2030 agenda, when we are talking about, about um, health and about fighting poverty, are we talking about the salvation of souls or are we becoming a secular organization trying to build something on this world, in this world, on this earth? Okay, so one of the things I think we have to, to take into consideration is whether the church is becoming a, a philanthropic organization, an international organization, um, because it just, you know, you, you're, you're looking at social justice issues and there is no real a salvation of souls as, as a motive or a spiritual and moral mission. Now, uh, if that's the case and that's what's going on, I, we're, we're really lost. And, and Our Lady of La Salette, who talked about uh, a loss of faith in, um, in, in, in Rome and the seat of the Antichrist uh, comes to mind to me frequently. But I also know that there, there are people that don't agree with that interpretation or a redaction that included that sentence. It's been improved for other things. And there's some popes that have very much hope in the last select message because of a a turning away from sin and repentance and, and penance and suffering and, and mortification. But in my mind, um, it's unclear really what the motive of the Holy See is. It, it's, it's unclear. It, it certainly doesn't seem to be a spiritual and moral mission. It seems to be something based on um, liberation theology. And as we know, liberation theology uh, was has been rejected, but since Pope Francis um, has uh, his pontificate, uh, he has invited um, those who promote uh, th liberation theology uh, to conferences, you know, especially the Amazon Synod. So one of the things that's happening is that we're reverting back um, to 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 arguments and ways of thinking that were absolutely rejected in the magisterium. And, and that, and that's a concern. And, and as I, I go forward and I, and it's like, I'm criticizing some of the policies of the Vatican. I will say this as a Catholic, and I use the word love because in English love is used in these contexts. There's not many other words. I love the Pope because the Pope is the Pope and I'm Catholic. However, I'm also an academic. And these policies I've been studying, I do not understand them from the Holy See's perspective. I understand that they give arguments to the effect, it's business as usual, this is dialogue. Um, we dialogue with everybody, including um, depopulation people, people that have devoted their career uh, to, to promoting the killing of babies. 
We dialogue with everybody. I don't even understand what that means, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Because dialogue, in my view, is communication of the truth. So, so Pope Benedict had this saying, it's truth builds consensus. Consensus does not build truth. Can I, play, uh, can I play a little bit of uh, Advocatus Diaboli uh, regarding the specifics of the sustainable goal, the uh, sustainable development goals? Because some of them, as you rightly said, that they are fight with poverty, but there are also some related to uh, raising education. So I understand that uh, the Vatican signed this uh, Agenda uh, 230 together with sustainable goal develop uh, sustainable development goals in the spirit of supporting the human development, human flourishing. And there were these two notes clarifying what gender means and what uh, uh, what gender equality means and what uh, reproductive rights mean. Do you think that uh, this kind of uh, operations that we sign the, uh, the, uh, the agenda, we support agenda, but then we give uh, clarifications does it is that strategy effective because people rarely read uh, notices uh, some additional annexes to such uh, documents do you think that the the position of the holy see expressed in 2015 and 16 is widely known that the vatican crit criticized interpretation radical interpretation of the uh, sustainable goals uh, in, included in agenda 230 okay so um what you're referring to actually is something on the international scale called uh, legal reservations. And so anyone can look at the Vienna Convention, the law of treaties and, and go to that convention, skim down and read what a legal reservation does. It modifies uh, the legal obligation uh, in, a con in, in a document. If you have 193 states negotiating a document, that would be absolutely impossible for everyone to agree on everything. So reservations are a way to promote agreement among states, but at the same time you say, listen, I just can't, I, I just can't agree with this. And this is the reason why. The one qualification is if you go against the object and purpose of the convention itself. Now, what, what the Holy See did is in 2015, this is common, right at the point that the documents is, is, is completed, the Holy See then registers its reservations and it talks about the wording and, and how it's going to define terms. It did it again in a note uh, in 2016, a year later, that was more extensive. And so both those documents together are extremely helpful to the average person if they know that they exist. It's good for nuncios, extremely helpful to nuncios, extremely helpful um, to bishops. If, if specifically if they're planning these events. But here's what usually is supposed to happen. When the Holy See gives speeches or statements and is at the Holy See, the way that it's gone in the past is that it explains a little bit about itself. This is, you know, introduces itself, who it is. And then it, it, it says, you know, we really respect the, the, the United Nations as a forum, bringing people together. And it usually has some comments that are very positive about the, the United Nations. And then it has some, usually some comments that are very positive about what's going on. And then you get into the, but you're going off in the wrong direction on these points, A, B, C, D, and E. We're not getting any critique anymore. That's the problem. The real problem is, is we're getting no critique. We're getting the Holy See arm in arm with the United Nations. And that's something that's new. And that's something as an academic that I'm studying. That's why I'm doing a docu documentary on the negotiations of, of the Holy See uh, that took place in the mid 1990s. So we do not forget that piece of history because it's the history that founds this new UN Agenda 2030. And so I, I don't understand how the Holy See can go forward and, and, and not critique and offer 
where the errors are and that's just not happening that, that was very useful we need to move now to great resets because you, we would like to focus on your very important article how you would define this uh, this you already mentioned that and you alluded in in the former uh, responses but what are the what how this vision of klaus schwab is so different from christian vision of of, of a man or of a society well, number one, Klaus Schwab is very clear. He does not believe that there's such a thing as objective truth. Uh, that's that's in his book. Okay. Uh, he actually talks a little bit about um, certain thinkers' vision of who man is, and he said they, you know, they made it up, and they just made it up about who man is, and I'm going to make it up. And his fourth industrial revolution is all about the new man and the new man includes computer chips in their body in their clothes and this is something he's spoken to openly on in interviews and it's in his book so he wants to create the new man it has nothing to do with the judeo-christian belief system we do not have a man that's that's made in the image and likeness of god we do not have a man, male, female. We don't have a man with a, a common origin, dignity and destiny created by God here to serve and love God and to go back to God in love. And we're talking about a triune God. I mean, I mean, this is just foreign to him. He plans to make it up and it actually uses those words. He's going to make it up. So when the Holy See intervenes, the Holy See does not intervene in a vacuum. We have this depth uh, of our faith and of uh, the, the, the understanding of Christian anthropology. Then we have these wonderful principles of subsidiarity and the common good and it just goes on. And we have a depth of, of the social doctrine of the church. It's not only two encyclicals. Uh, that are being cited on the COVID Commission website of the Holy See. An another trend that's quite disturbing is the fact that under the umbrella of dialogue, uh, Pope Francis has been asking this, this woman who's an atheist and promotes abortion, who's just been promoted to the Pontifical Academy of Your Life, it turns out from an article of a scholar at Catholic University that she's actually writing things for that website, which makes sense because when I went to the website, it had good local practices for one of their first reports. And it talked about political activism, using a church for COVID, COVID care, um, stopping disinformation, there was nothing about faith in God. There was nothing about mass and worship. But it makes sense if you've got an atheist who's writing is writing your your scripts for your COVID com commission. It's 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 an absolute crisis of faith is what's happening. Mm -hmm. T t turning back to Great Resets, <laughs> how you view this development, if Great Resets is implemented, how would it impact democracy, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion? How Klaus Schwab uh, imagines his uh, world uh, under this major change? Okay, so the major change is basically burn everything down and start from square one, okay? So that's your reset. I, how, how you produce food, uh, how you use energy, what you buy. He, it's always for surveillance, no property. We're getting into global communism. Um, how is he going to do this? He does it through what he's called uh, public-private partnerships. And, and, and it's according to an ethic that includes capitalistic ideas, but also communist ideas. I mean, these people that are thinking this up have benefited greatly from the capitalist system but they're working to impose a, a communist system for the peasants and which I include myself, I'll be one of them. And, and so this is what's happening right now. And the model is China. And, um, you know, you, he's using COVID because, and he explains why COVID as an emergency, because you have to declare an emergency. 
then the global elite then makes the one person starts making executive decisions or regulations and you don't have a parliament. And then you start implementing these things. We saw it in Biden administration. We saw it in Trudeau. We saw it in Australia. And all of a sudden we have all these decrees and people, people have to wear masks. They, they can't, they're losing their jobs. I mean, this is how it functions. And it, what's interesting is the public private partnership. They do not want states entering into treaties without states because they're cut out of that process. They are entering into bilateral agreements, but they are not considered states. So when they were talking about um, certain treaties that should be made, you will have a voice coming from the W uh, Economic Forum and supporters talking, no, 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 you don't need a treaty. No, 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 no. We can handle this private, private public relations um, stakeholders. Remember that the public private stakeholders means correlatively a decrease in, in, in democracy, a democratic uh, deficit. These corporations do not care about the common good, do not care about fundamental human rights, but they paint themselves as saying, listen, we're the new socioeconomic plan because we're working together and it's a collaboration. No, it's all about control, to control food and everything. In fact, they create the crisis so let's look at the oil and gas crisis. It's not all tied to Russia. Let's look at the um, whatever crisis you want to pick. The the the, the uh, climate change one is one of my favorites. The COVID change, the COVID one's a favorite of mine. So is the climate change. You get everybody worked up like there's we're going to need an emergency, and then everyone gets locked down. Then you have a uh, crisis, and then so then you can the people that have created the crisis then offer the solution. And let's look at, for example, the food crisis. You've actually entered into an agreement, World Economic Forum with the Netherlands, to stop cattle breeding. So you're taking, wiping out the cattle breeding, then we're going to give insects. But at the same time that you're convincing the leader of the, you know, the, the, the Netherlands, you, you can tell them, listen, Here's the problem. We're not going to have much food, but here's the solution. And you should invest in it. And you're going to make a lot of money. Create the problem. Find the solution. Convince people to invest in the solution that they're going to be billionaires. And there you've got it. You've just one step closer to whatever you want to do from a global communism and have us all under control. I, people, I, I, yeah, people I, need to, to study this. Hmm. What you're saying about Premier uh, Prime Minister Rutte from Netherlands, he claims uh, under uh, using uh, some scientific evidence that uh, cattle produces methane, and methane is four times worse than CO2. So th that's their justification for limiting the uh, farming in in Holland, which is the second largest producer of of food, which might result in uh, hunger in some parts of the world. So that, that, that's that's the uh, let's say justification he he provided. Oh, I'm absolutely, sure. absolutely, absolutely. It's a climate change justification for why you're creating uh, food scarcity because you want to transition all of us to bugs, and so we can buy bugs from the state. And so uh, Bill Gates has just invested in some online grocery store that's billions of dollars because we'll be ordering all our food from the state but that's but that's the rationale oh it's oh it's climate change i would like to see the statistics on the methane and here's a person you should consider talking to jordan peterson so jordan peterson has a bunch of videos out on the climate change issue and he was on a climate change committee within the united nations and the guy's a speed reader he's a brain intellectual powerful intellect that started to try to understand this problem and he went through all the studies read it and the only thing he could conclude was this if you 
If you give more money to poor people, if you give them property, if you let them be take hold of their own lives with their own property, they take more interest in the environment because it's theirs. They take care of their backyards, their trees, their plants because they own it. And he said, the only thing I could I could conclude as a result or what sort of solution is would be to empower poverty, poverty stricken areas. And 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 I remember watching him and a woman stood up and said, well, come on. Don't you think that this global issue of climate is going to bring us all together and we're here fighting for the climate and it'll bring us together. It'll be one thing that we can work on. And he listened and she went on for 15 minutes and he just said, no. <laughs> That's a brilliant response. <laughs> well, you know, <clears throat> I, I, I went on a website of the World Economic Forum, Forum and, I, and I read their eight predictions for, for year 2030. Um, and they're, I, I'm not sure if, if they're predictions or if they're just goals that uh, people should strive for. And um, one of the, the number one is <clears throat> all products will have become services, meaning you will own nothing and you will be yes. happy. <laughs> yes. Contrary, no right. And in terms of the in terms of the climate change, it says today's refugees will become tomorrow's CEOs. And at that same point, it says that the climate change is going to displace 1 billion people from the south and move, it, move them up north, which means, which means about 500 million people coming to Canada and the United States and another 500 million people coming to Europe because these are the countries where the poor displaced people will go. And uh, if, if this uh, is uh, um, sort of the prediction, if this is the plan towards their working, all of the actions that they are taking seem to be very logical. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Maloney, is it Maloney, the Prime Minister of Italy? I have on my website, on the International Catholic Jurist Forum website, she appeared at a, a world meeting of families, and she's a firebomb. Mm -hmm. And uh, she got up. And, you know, they had people protesting and she got up and I, I think it's three minutes. And she hit all the high points and basically was, uh, you're trying to take away our identity. I can't say I'm a mother. I can't say I'm a Christian. I can't say I'm a woman. I can't say I'm an Italian. Because what, what they want is perfect consumers. And that's slavery absolute slavery we will be the the consumer and slave and and as they get better at their technology then the ones that you know they don't need we, they get wiped out i mean you know as as uh as i follow the china situation the last thing i was uh heard i don't know whether it's true but xi jinping was creating these COVID camps. I mean, the idea is to actually serve these global elites, we will all be enslaved. And, and, and it's, that's essentially what's happening in China. Those people are enslaved by that COVID app. But we also saw uh, camps uh, in Australia. Yes. Yes. And they're actually the same material that the, the Chinese were using. Yes. So and, it's and, not a local problem. <laughs> yeah, it's got nothing to do with COVID. It's about controlling people. So with Trudeau, he had these uh, hotels, I guess. He used hotels. But they're concentration camps. We're in a democracy that's, that's turning into totalitarian regimes. And people that want to want to keep on believing that it's, that it's uh, sickness. You know, from... The Christians really have to uh, take up the sword here because we are supposed to have faith in God and we are supposed to have our life in order and, and, and understanding that 
that our life could be taken any single day. And we are supposed to be ready for that. We are not supposed to be filled with fear. And we cannot be filled with fear. And there is no excuse for the closing of those churches. And those bishops and those priests that did not do what they could to make sure that the, the lay persons could get the sacraments, they will have to answer for that. Here's the comment from one of the viewers uh, uh, quoting John Paul II, Cent Centesimus Annus, as you can see, as history demonstrates, a democracy without values easily turns into open or thinly disguised totalitarianism. There you is go. The message, is it the message for today? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that beautiful quote. Yes. And the second comment, as you see, is there any relation between Great Reset and uh, the ability to print money? Because we've got uh, such a huge debt in every, almost every, each and every country, which might right. lead to, to collapse of economy. That's it. You're trying, as I said before, you want to burn down everything. You have to burn down everything. Politics, social, uh, the food, the econo econ economics, everything. Everything. That's the reset. Everything is going to be under control. It has to be reset in every in every phase. That's why when you look at the agenda 2030, it's a totalitarian document in concept, in end, in means, in terminology. I, I go through that in my article. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle of it. We are running slowly out of time, so I would be very happy if you could conclude with some guidance or advice for the future. What just lay people like ourselves can do to 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 respond to this challenge and to understand better the the, the, the magnitude of this challenge and and to to pass the faith to next generation. What your your thoughts on that? My my thoughts are my thoughts are uh doing a little bit more meditation on death and 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 praying about death and getting ready for death um and why because it reduces the fear and 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 the fear is what they use against us that's number one and it's faith in god and, and making sure that we're 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 in our communities, in our families, and we're staying tight with, with the faith, number one, and we're helping each other. And then uh, number two, use our reason. If something doesn't make sense, you shouldn't be following it. And if you're not filled with fear, fear you will be reasoning appropriately. We have that. And of course, we've got revelation to make sure that we're right, we're right, we're reasoning rightly. We have to be strong as Christians to help other people. We have to be able to stand up. Jane, and a word of advice to us here in Central Europe and in Poland specifically. Um, from an outsider, what do you think, what's your advice? You know, you have this incredible um, and deep uh, Catholic tradition, and that is to uh, continue with your customs and your, your traditions and fight um, the good fight, uh, which is which is which is which is being uh, leveled against you from the European Union in particular, and uh, it'll come from uh, the United Nations as well. And you've got outside money coming in to promote uh, groups uh, to destroy uh, the Catholic culture here. You have one of the greatest attacks going on right now is to uh, destroy John Paul II's legacy. And that's going on in a furious way. And I, I, I really do think that um, increased uh, adoration, uh, if you can do hours of adoration and, 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 and and start organizing that, that's going to be uh, helpful to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very, very helpful and uh, encouraging. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for this meeting. I would like to thank our viewers. Uh, 
uh, let me mention that you can go to Ave Maria University website to law school to see more of uh, Jane uh, articles. Uh, the article she mentioned will be published in the uh, journal issued by Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński University in Warsaw in, in Polish and English. And uh, we encourage you to join us for the next interview, which will be probably in, in January. We'll let you know. Thank you for your patience and uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you.